Former four-star general Dwight D. Eisenhower was president of the United States. Richard M. Nixon was vice president. The country was in the midst of a post-war boom. More houses built, more cars produced, more college graduates, and more babies birthed than ever before. 1953. The room reeked of burnt rubber. Pain sizzled my flesh before I smelled the scorch of my shirt. Another burn scar to add to my collection, I thought. Someone was shouting my name. Ericsson, the steward wants to see you. I turned from the red-hot iron mould full of melted rubber gaskets and took off my apron. They're probably going to fire me for spending too much time at the first aid cabinet, I joked to the guy next to me. Co-workers on the night shift at Schmidt Rubber Gasket Company in Minneapolis made room for me to walk behind them. About 40 unskilled men, including some World War II vets, were working on their hot moulds, but not getting burned as often as I did. The shop steward was waiting for me in his office. He leaned back in his chair and glared at me. This is a closed shop. After 30 days, you have to join the union or get laid off. To make small talk with this officious guy was impossible. Really? No one told me that before. I have to think about it, I said, as I turned around and left. Another snafu. My mind searched for a way out. I didn't know much about labour unions in the United States, but I had read news articles in the Minneapolis Tribune about this one, the leadership was communist. Next morning, I worriedly called the FBI to make certain that I wouldn't be deported if I joined. The guy on the other end laughed at me. If you need to join to keep your job, no problem. On the other hand, deportation didn't sound so bad. Several months before... I had given up an excellent job in Germany to live in the land of the free. After weeks of interviews with every company that advertised for accountants or merchandiser buyers, I saw that my letters of reference and education counted for nothing. Employers didn't want to take a chance on a guy with foreign credentials and an accent. Gainful employment looked hopeless until my friend and sponsor, Walter, told me that he heard about a company that needed more help. Don't worry, they'll take almost anybody. That hurt, but they had hired me immediately for the smelly job. In a few short weeks, I had saved enough money from my salary to rent a duplex. My landlord, a salesman, had married a German war bride, and they treated us like relatives when we moved in. My landlord even found me a different job as a salesman for the Ibert Coffee Company. Walter had let me drive his Kaiser Fraser, but now I needed my own car to cover my sales route. He helped me pick out a trustworthy 1946 Oldsmobile, which I drove from door to door to deliver coffee, tea and coffee makers. This was back when most married women stayed home with their children and they had time to make coffee and chat in the kitchen with salesmen. The wives gave me an introduction to typical American family life. This was exactly how I wanted my family to live someday. As the Christmas holidays drew closer, I enjoyed the sight of decorations and the smell of freshly baked Christmas cookies. At the same time, the burden of my war experiences rose to the forefront of my consciousness. Angst compelled me to kindle my dad's annual ritual in the New World. As a soldier during World War I, he had carried a collapsible miniature Christmas tree with candles. In a trench somewhere in France on Christmas Eve, he lit the candles and sang carols with his buddies. By the end of the war, his heart was heavy with the deaths of close friends killed in battle. Each year on a quiet night before Christmas, he played carols, lit the candles on his little tree again, and let the angst descend. As a child, when I found him sitting in the dark with tears rolling down his face, I asked, What are you doing, Daddy? I'm sad right now. Can I be sad with you? Of course, sit here by me. We would stare into the flames. My only sadness was that Christmas, with its sweets and toys, was still days away. My father's sadness went so deep that I longed to comfort him. His eyes reflected a list of dead friends filed away in his memory. He opened the file on this occasion in order to honour them one by one. When I returned from captivity, 
I joined him in his Christmas ritual again, this time with pangs of my own. Now I had a list to grieve over. Visions of my fallen classmates, soldiers and fellow captives, and tidbits of our banter surfaced in my mind. I let myself feel anguish over their deaths again, as I prayed for their eternal souls. When I lit their candles for the first time in the new world, I knew I would keep this ritual to honour their memories for the rest of my life. My five-year-old son, Jörg, asked me the same question I had asked my father. What are you doing, Daddy? I told him that a lot of Germans get melancholy at Christmas, while I inwardly hoped that he would never have to cope with a survivor's sense of loss and guilt. He had taken the move to the United States in stride until Christmas packages from home arrived. Then he wanted to know why we couldn't get in the car and go visit his grandparents, Omar and Opa, and his cousin, Helga. Although we were in America, I carried on the Christmas traditions. For the first time, I made my own Advent wreath, and on Christmas Eve I gave my son the same treat I got as a boy. I decorated the Christmas tree in secret and showed it to him while candles on metal holders clipped to the boughs blazed in glory for a few precious moments. In our neighbourhood, I saw various European ethnic groups reach back to into their cultures to celebrate religious holidays. My son enjoyed the holiday spirit and gifts more than anyone else. He was content. He liked his daycare providers and the little job I gave him. He helped me shelve the Ibert boxes. Root salesmen like myself kept products in their basements. One day, the Ibert men came to my house and said they were taking an inventory. Afterwards, they gave me a slip to sign and left. I gasped when I read it. I hereby voluntarily resign from the Ibert Coffee Company. Slick move, with my resignation, they wouldn't have to pay unemployment compensation since my signature made me ineligible. Jobless again, I complained about my treatment to Union Hall, where a union steward hired me right away. He looked me straight in the eye. All you have to do is make a weekly visit to this list of bars and nightclubs that I'm going to give you. Collect an envelope from each one and immediately seal it shut if it's not already closed. Got that? This is an important job. I'm counting on you. The job seemed easy enough, even though I had to drive around at night to unfamiliar places. Some of the bars were dark, seedy dives where only men hung out. They were nothing like the well-lit family-style bars we had in Germany. I noticed right away that some owners seemed angry, others seemed afraid. Would someone jump me when I left? I couldn't figure out what was going on until I dropped an open envelope in the car and saw a $100 bill. What was this? Extortion? What would it do to my application for citizenship? I had to think of a way to get out of the job without getting the union boss mad at me. The next day, I told the union steward that I was obligated under the terms of my citizenship application to use my clerical skills in America. I thanked him for helping me out, and he thanked me for helping him out. The union sent me off on a series of temporary warehouse jobs, heavy work for low pay. As Minnesota's chilly fall segged into icy cold winter, I shivered as I turned the key in the olds and fervently hoped it would start. If it did, I turned on the defroster and waited for the windshield to clear. During those times when I had nothing to do, memories rushed unbidden into my thoughts, such as my office in Germany, where I wore a suit and a tie instead of a grey workman's uniform. I'd chase the memory away and concentrate on the frost slowly thawing on the windshield. But another memory would appear, like my parents sitting in their comfortable living room, chatting with me over tea. I could be there instead of here. Again, I would banish the memory by watching the defrosting process, but to no avail. As the cold enveloped me, I tried not to make comparisons or question whether immigration to America was a wise decision. I'd get out of the car and shovel the snow and ice away from the car like a madman. There's nothing like heavy physical work to chase away the poltergeists and hobgoblins of the mind. When I'd get back in the car, the windows were clear and so was my head. As I steered into the street, I reminded myself that nearly every German immigrant I met said they would have gone back to Germany the first year if they'd had the money to buy a ticket. 
I'd cheer myself up with pleasant memories of my first weeks in America with Walter as my guide. In order to defray my travel costs to Minneapolis, he'd driven all the way to New York from Minnesota in his new Kaiser Fraser to pick us up. He'd given us a comfortable introduction to the Midwest. By the time we crossed the Minnesota border, the green rolling hills reminded me of Schleswig-Holstein. Even the black and white spotted herds of milk cows were Holsteins, the same as in my home state. Unlike in Germany, American farming methods were already mechanised, Walter pointed out. Unlike me, he understood the workings of every type of machine. Walter had prospered in America by following his father's training and knack for business. His relatives in the United States had helped him, along with his mother and sister, to immigrate soon after his repatriation. In five years, Walter had realised the American dream. He owned a house, a car, and a machine shop. Even though Walter was tolerant of the needs of our family, he was a bachelor and had every intention of remaining so. He was eager to show off his newly purchased duplex, which he would share with us until I could find a job and a place to rent. This was the first time I had seen the inside of an American house. At first glance, it seemed flimsy, with walls less than one foot thick. These houses would never stand up to a bombing, I blurted out. Walter looked at me quizzically and said, Why should they? Well, I said rather lamely, I like your place, though. It's a lot more modern than the apartments back home, and besides, you own it. How could I have forgotten about the labour-saving devices, the ever-ready supply of hot water? How wonderful it felt to take a bath or a shower with hot water again, rather than with a little basin of water heated in a teapot. Another marvel of mass-produced engineering stood in the basement, a large furnace that heated the whole house with steam forced through radiators in every room. No one here had to carry coal up from the basement to heat little tile stoves in each room. Walter had already become used to these luxuries. He tried to teach us the do's and don'ts of American life as we ate an American supper of canned baked beans, hot dogs, and corn on the cob one night. Eat with your fork in the right hand and use the knife with your left instead the opposite, like in Europe, he told us. Suddenly I remembered the unusual table manners of American civilians I had observed. Immediately I switched my fork to the right and laid down my knife. But don't use a knife and fork on snacks, those you eat with your hand. Which snacks? I asked. Walter looked surprised. Oh, you know, the wurst and corn on the cob you've been trying to eat with a knife and fork, and pizza and hamburgers. Worst, they call frankfurters or hot dogs. I liked to tease Walter, who was always so serious. What do hamburgers have to do with Hamburg, or frankfurters with Frankfurt? And why is it called a hot dog? I asked. Walter frowned at my silliness and said, Idiot, how should I know? He pushed himself back from the table. Here you call everyone by their first name, even older people. If they tell you, it's okay. The only people you address by title are medical doctors, and their wives are not called Mrs. Doctor as they are in Germany. Walter had spilled a spot of milk on his shirt and was dabbing at it with a napkin as he enlightened me further. When you're introduced to a woman, you don't grab her hand and shake it unless she offers it. And don't make your little German bow to anyone either. It makes you look too foreign. I took that in and hoped I'd remember. Walter stood up and walked over to open a window. The windows were different too. Double-paned, they slid up from the bottom instead of opening out like doors as they did in our country. In the summer, the windows could be raised and full-length screens kept out the insects. It's July and it's hot. I know you'll want to go to all the lakes here, but for heaven's sake, don't change into your swimming suit on the beach like Germans do, or you'll get arrested. Good advice. I didn't want any trouble with the law. As I spent time outdoors, I met the natives, many of whom were first, second and third generation Germans and Scandinavians. Lutheran and Roman Catholic churches predominated in Minneapolis. My appearance, lifestyle, work ethic and values were very much like those of my neighbours. 
I thought I understood Americans after working with civilians in prisoner of war camps. But they were Southerners and different in some ways from people of the North. Not only did they speak with a different accent and use different colloquialisms, they coped with extreme seasonal changes. Minnesotans were in an endless cycle of preparation. Homes, cars, and wardrobes had to be ready for the next season, particularly for the hot, humid summers and the Siberian like winters. Even though I had lived in America, I had no idea of how Americans actually lived. I was in for a lot of surprises, good and bad. The best surprise happened on my second day in America as a free man when Walter took me to a supermarket. I excitedly rushed up and down every aisle, poking Walter on the arm and exclaiming, Look at that, Walter, so cheap. I couldn't get over the variety and the low prices. I knew we would never be hungry again. My obsession with food disappeared that day. As long as I could earn money, there would be an abundance of food. I wasn't afraid of hard work. Plentiful food was a great reward. Eventually, the union sent me to Midland Cooperatives, a large agricultural equipment company that hired me full-time with benefits. They started me at the bottom of the ladder as a union shipping clerk in their warehouse. The pay scale was higher than for my other jobs so far, but my qualifications meant nothing to them. My eye was still on the white-collar positions I had held before. With my usual high energy, I worked circles around easy-going clerks and hoped someone in management would notice. If they noticed, they probably liked my high productivity so well that they kept me where I was. It didn't take long for me to realise that I would never be one of the boys in America. Conversations revolved around sports that I didn't know anything about. Football had rules and terminology that I couldn't get a grip on. Soccer, the sport I understood because I played it, was not popular in America then. When they took me to baseball games and asked me what was going on, I drew a blank. My co-workers laughed and good-naturedly called me Kraut. Discrimination was something that I expected since I was working with Americans, who had fought against the Axis in France. Yet among the shipping clerks, I never felt anything but a little teasing over my accent or one of my cultural blunders. However, it took the company 12 years to move me up to a management level, and then only because I broke my leg on the job and couldn't work in the warehouse. They started me as an internal auditor and promoted me several times to my final position as assistant merchandiser buyer. Nevertheless, with careful money management, I was able to realise the American dream three years after Midland hired me. I bought a new ranch-style home in the suburbs and a new car. One of the proudest days of my life occurred five years after my immigration. Immigrants prepared themselves for citizenship by studying American history and government. When I heard that I passed the test the first time I took it, it meant everything to me. At my hearing, a judge reviewed my paperwork, looked over his bifocals and asked, Heinrich Richard Max Erickson, why do you have so many names? I don't know exactly. I believe I was named after uncles that my parents favoured. You don't need all those names in America. Which name do you want to get rid of? I don't care, just strike one out. He eliminated Max, now a popular name. The citizenship ceremony with speeches from prominent politicians moved me. With a prayer and a certificate, I had become a citizen of the most wonderful country on earth. Little did I know that I would attend similar ceremonies in the future for my adopted immigrant children, or that I would cause thousands more to take place for other children who were born abroad, adopted, and brought to America. During my first years in America, German immigrants colonised neighbourhoods in Minneapolis. Not all of them acculturated. Some could only find fault with American customs and culture and did nothing but complain. Many of the newer arrivals never tried to learn English. Worse yet, they made no attempt to obtain US citizenship. Somehow, they found jobs with other German speakers and lived for weekends when they could try to create the Gemütlichkeit that they formerly had in Europe. For some, their dream was to go back to Germany to show off their newfound wealth. 
Small house parties evolved, and the groups eventually joined with full-fledged clubs established by Germans who had immigrated before World War I. The members could not relate to what we, who had immigrated after World War II, had been through. Yet here, everyone could get back to their roots. Most just wanted to talk and to sing and dance to German melodies. The German club had also organised men's choirs and women's gymnastic groups. Among the new members who arrived after World War II were survivors of the Holocaust. Native-born German speakers, they also had a need to be in touch with the culture in which they had grown up. They spoke German and Yiddish, which has Germanic roots. The survivors were tattooed, a sight that sent a chill up my spine. Nazis had tattooed numbers on the forearms of every person forced into concentration camps. When the Jews had disappeared from Kiel, I was a child living under a dictatorship that planned to exterminate the Jewish population. I knew nothing about Judaism. In prisoner of war camp, I made up for lost time and informed myself at the library with books on Jewish history and beliefs. Once I settled in America, I finally had the chance to go to the library to learn more about Jewish philosophical and religious movements and the differences between orthodox, conservative and reform synagogues. According to news I heard in America, the West German government tried to help those who lived through the Holocaust. Release from the concentration camps left the survivors homeless and penniless. When the German government had money in its coffers again, it made reparation payments to Israel to send to the survivors. At the German club, where I thought I was one of the youngest, I saw a short guy with brown hair and brown eyes who looked about 25. I took him aside. I wondered how he ever got into the German army. Turns out his story was far more unusual and tragic than that. Manny Goldman was an adolescent when the US Army liberated the camps. His entire family had lost their lives and he had no place to go. As a Jewish child, he had been denied an education. Smart as he was, Manny could barely read or write. When word got around that Manny was living on the street by the railroad station, several German families took responsibility for him until he was old enough to manage on his own. He married a German girl and immigrated. By the time I met him, he and his wife had opened a successful sandwich shop with his reparation money. His circle of devoted customers grew because, regardless of what had happened, he was basically a friendly, optimistic guy. All of them knew the story behind his tattooed numbers. When the subject of concentration camps came up, his pretty blonde wife told me, His memories are extremely confused. It was just too terrible. Manny lost his parents, his brothers and sisters, and the rest of his relatives one by one. He felt so lonely. He doesn't mind talking about it, but he's not too sure what was real and what was a nightmare anymore. Some Jews chose to remain in Germany. Regardless of what had happened, there seemed to be a need in every Christian and Jew to return, at least for a visit, to the motherland. Somehow I was able to save money for a trip to see my relatives soon after immigration, probably because I hadn't adjusted to spending as much of my income as Americans did on living expenses. Of course, Germany had changed very little since my departure. The trip reinforced my conviction that the United States was a land of limitless opportunities, regardless of my difficulties in getting settled here. My American dream went kaput when my wife walked out on me. When we married, she continued to live as if she were still single. She kept her personal life separate from mine and went out with her friends in Kiel. After immigration, I thought that she would finally adjust to marriage. But as soon as she heard about the German parties, she got excited. She took off on a continual round of them, whereas I preferred to stay home with our son. Although she had shown little interest in learning English before immigration, she quickly learned to speak the language and to drive a car, and she found a job in a bank. She created a new social circle of German friends that soon widened to include Americans. The chasm between us kept widening until, after 12 years of marriage, she fell in love with an American. When our union was legally dissolved in county court, I made history as the first father granted custody in Anoka County, Minnesota. Even though my ex was granted visiting rights, 
She only asked to see our son once in the following six years. He was shattered by her desertion. Depressing, yet I couldn't give in to it. I called her my ex-wife. My son called her my ex-mother. He seemed to need more comforting than I could give him. Should I return to Germany so that my son would have loving relatives surrounding him? They would help me raise him to adulthood. I wrestled with the issue for months. I talked to friends, neighbours, the school and my minister. Most of them approached my problem with pragmatism. They believed that our return would be one more difficult adjustment for him, since he would have to deal with the same school system as I had. He would have to make a lot of adjustments. He was a good student here and well-liked by his teachers, who told me he was college material. If he had the desire and the finances, he could earn a college degree. In Germany, they would give him a test to determine his educational capabilities from then on. Vocational school, technical school or college. My fate, a technical school, had been determined with a test when I was a hyperactive ten-year-old. For me, the move would mean that I would have to give up everything I had worked for in order to face an uncertain future career-wise in Germany. The job I had with the British was long gone. If I returned to Germany, I could say goodbye house, goodbye car, goodbye continuing education. I decided to stay. I was determined to obtain an American college degree. I took the first steps toward my goal when I enrolled in an accounting course. In the meantime, my son and I adjusted to our new situation. We still had good friends, nice neighbours, a house in the suburbs, and our church. Eventually, I met an American woman, Jean, who was in similar circumstances with her nine-year-old son, Arthur. She was 28 at the time, and I thought she was pretty. Her job in publications paid as well as mine. She managed to accomplish a lot at once, including cooking gourmet meals. I was smitten. My German accent and my foreign ways did not put her off. One of her grandfathers was a first-generation German immigrant. Her grandfather and grandmother on the other side of the family were first-generation immigrants from Sweden. Even her father had spoken with a Swedish accent. Both sets of grandparents were farmers who had homesteaded in Minnesota. Jean was born and had spent the first ten years of her life in the tiny Norwegian-American village of Sacred Heart, Minnesota, where she had become accustomed to hearing another language and participating in another culture. Even though we were born on opposite sides of the Atlantic, we had a lot in common – heritage, values, Lutheranism, and even a cuisine. Both of us coped with the responsibility of home ownership, a full-time job, continuing our education and, most importantly, raising a son to be a responsible adult. As their sole means of physical, emotional and financial support, we took our duties seriously. Jean's son, Arthur, was three-quarters German, a tall, blonde, blue-eyed boy like my son, Jörg. An intelligent, resourceful boy, I hoped that he would take a liking to me. In the letters I wrote to my parents each week, I began writing about Jean. My family urged caution. When I told them I had asked her to marry me, my mother and sister were shocked. They had only seen American women in the movies and on TV. Did she wear makeup, high heels and smoke cigarettes? At that time, she did it all. Did she know anything about housekeeping and cooking? American women were glamorous creatures who never did anything useful in the movies back then. Jean's mother wasn't thrilled with me either. Even though she was half German herself, she was prejudiced against me. The subject of the Nazis and the maltreatment of Jews always seemed to come up. Yet if I tried to explain my age at the time of the war, or the suffering my family had endured as a result of it, she ignored me. Despite our relatives' skepticism, we were married in 1961, joining two households and two only children. I went back to county court again to adopt John's son. Our major task was to try to get them to adjust to each other. We bought model airplanes for them to build, which they worked on together and equally enjoyed. We took them on picnics and to art and history museums. Sundays were special days that we always spent together. Our new family learned everything any of us ever wanted to know about being a stepchild or a step-parent. 
our sons had a lot to contend with in those days when divorce was still a rarity. The boys watched the news with me. We were all feeling proud of our well-educated, polished president, John F. Kennedy. At that time, the papers were full of stories of dangerous escapes by East Berliners into West Berlin. They tied themselves under cars, tunnelled through buildings, and flew across the wall in gliders. Some of them tried to just make a run for it and were shot in full view of their relatives on the other side. During that time, Kennedy travelled to Germany to show America's support of West Berlin. He made his famous speech with a line that no one who heard it ever forgot, Ich bin ein Berliner. Yet he was partly responsible for our war in Vietnam. American teachers were sending our sons home with conflicting ideas. Arthur said, I'm going to join up as soon as I'm old enough, because we have to win. On another day, he would come home and express other ideas, which I shared, war is futile. Arthur struggled with the ideology of the hawks and the doves. By the time both boys graduated, they had been exposed to all of the counterculture ideas of that era and had no desire to take part in the Vietnam War. This was a difficult time for parents who tried to enforce rules that no longer seemed valid. Many teenagers felt that the rug had been pulled out from under them. They tried to make up their own rules as they went along. Even though our sons and their peers were tantalised by different ways of thinking, believing and behaving, their innate sense of morality eventually brought them through to responsible adulthood. We managed to visit Germany twice before our sons graduated high school. The first time was a year after we married. A few weeks before we left, a fellow employee accidentally knocked me off a ladder. I fell twelve feet to the cement below, fortunately not head first, but this was when I broke my femur, the large weight-bearing bone in the thigh. Since we had saved and planned for over a year to take this six-week charter flight with our sons, I decided that we should go to Germany anyway. I learned to walk on crutches and used wheelchairs when I could. Knowing the trip from Frankfurt to Kiel by train would be difficult, my parents met us at the airport and helped us to the train station. Our boys were ten and fourteen and full of curiosity. Dazed after our long flight across the ocean, Jean snapped out of it when she met my sixty-seven-year-old father, who told her to call him Detlef. While my sixty-nine-year-old mother, Ellie, exuded a calm peacefulness and had grown grey-haired and a bit stout, my father was a five-foot-five-inch bundle of muscle, and he looked ten years younger. He wore the distinctive Keeler cap over his still dark brown hair and ordered everyone around as if he were still a policeman. He settled us into two Mercedes taxis with vases of roses on their dashboards to take us to the train station. Mother was shy with Jean, who was dressed in the latest fashion, a raw silk suit topped off with a beehive hairdo. Father got in the taxi with my wife and held her hand all the way to the train station, as if to say to her and my mother, Don't be afraid, I've got everything under control. Once aboard the train, my parents told me about all their preparations for our stay. They were still in the same apartment on the harbour, restored to its former self and now freshly wallpapered for our visit. When we arrived, I noticed that each room had vases of flowers and boxes of chocolates and other treats sent by friends, neighbours and relatives. Mother had given herself to others all of her life, and now they were reciprocating and making us feel like celebrities. John was impressed. She told them so in her best German. She had studied for a year in order to speak conversationally. But shortly after we arrived, she said, I can't understand them. She looked crestfallen. After I listened for a while, I realised that they were speaking Low German. When did you start speaking Low German at home? I asked. Well, my mother said, our son-in-law, Helmut, feels more comfortable speaking Low German, so we gradually started using it too. They had to make an effort to remember to speak in High German, so Jan understood operettas sung in High German that she watched on television better than she could understand my relatives. She tried to fit in, but it wasn't easy. She was surprised and delighted when my parents gave us their bedroom for the duration, 
she had never seen such a huge bed. It was piled high with red satin goose down comforters over layers of other goose down comforters with goose down pillows wedged high under trapezoid pillows. The huge bed was actually two beds pushed next to each other, each with its own separate bedding. While I gratefully eased myself into a reclining position, Jean scrabbled around trying to get comfortable. Do all Germans sleep sitting up? she asked. I never thought about it, but I guess they do, I said as I nodded off. We slept so soundly that Mother came into the room to wake us and grew alarmed. Since Jean couldn't find the light switch in the dark, she had given up trying to throw out all the pillows and wedges and had curled up at the opposite end of her bed. The head cannot point toward the window, Mother muttered. It brings bad luck to the house. I had forgotten all about her superstitions. The next day we settled into our pattern for the next six weeks. Our sons shared a room which had been sublet to a student who was temporarily housed elsewhere. Mother and father slept on fold-out couches in the combination living dining room. They were light sleepers and the first to rise, tidy up and make coffee. Over a breakfast of eggs, bread, jams and cheese, my mother would open a discussion on a daily activity plan. She would take everyone into consideration and help them come to an agreement. During our stay, the daily plan included sightseeing and obtaining extra items on mother's shopping list. Jeanne compared this to the helter-skelter way her own family dealt with each day and said, Now I see how you learned to keep everything running so smoothly. With little room for storage and four more people to feed, grocery shopping was done on our way back from day trips. Specialty shops abounded. Coffee, tea, fish, meat, vegetables and pastry. We ate like kings. An example of this vastly improved quality of life was at Elka Starmer's wedding. Elka was the baby my mother had helped deliver during an air raid. Elka's parents still lived upstairs. By pure chance, she had planned her wedding to take place while I was there. My parents and I could not help but marvel that we were together again and that their lives had improved more than we could have dreamed possible. In that very apartment, two decades before, mother starved, Uncle Hanny died, and my parents struggled with worrisome thoughts while my sister and I were soldiers and captives. Everyone in the building was proud of Elke, the red-headed baby born during the Blitz. She had grown into a beautiful, intelligent young woman and was trilingual, German, English and Icelandic. Her husband-to-be, an Icelander, shyly participated in all the weekend rituals to help her make certain they had the best possible start as a married pair. The most exciting ritual to our sons was the Poltera Bend, a noisy night for which all the guests had been saving up their old crockery. Even though they said they didn't believe in ghosts, they waited until it was dark. Then they tossed cracked wine bottles, jars, bowls, and even an old toilet under the bride's window with resounding crashes and lit firecrackers just to make certain that the poltergeist, the hobgoblin, was frightened away. When the bride-to-be invited the revellers upstairs to her parents' apartment, her groom-to-be nervously waited as one of the hosts for the sumptuous smorgasbord. Garnished trays of every kind of French and German cheese, as well as thinly sliced meats and smoked Kela sprat fish, and eel from the delicatessen accompanied loaves of white, pumpernickel and rye bread, as well as European-style hard-crusted rolls, Aperitifs, schnapps, as well as wine and a special concoction of champagne and pineapple brightened everyone's spirits. The special non-alcoholic beverage made from Johannes beer, a delicious small berry, was served to children. The wunderbar atmosphere got everyone into the mood to form a conga line, which led up and down the apartment stairs, snaked into my parents' apartment and curled around the table at which I was sitting with my crutches. Since I couldn't go upstairs on crutches very well, the party came to me. The following day, after the bride and groom swept up the crockery, they donned new suits for a civil ceremony. The day after that, they were decked out in traditional bridal gown and tuxedo for a wedding in the nearby church, which had been repaired after withstanding numerous bombings. After each ceremony, we feasted. By the fourth day, a fabulous lunch with traditional foods was even served for the friends and neighbours who had not been able to attend the other parties. 
No one had to dream about the wonderful German cuisine anymore. Mother could finally cook and dine on the fabulous dishes that she had eaten before the war. While my family's life was certainly not as full of the luxuries we had in America, they were living well. Jean and I bought my parents their first refrigerator, while mother liked it because she would no longer have to go shopping for food every day. Father didn't like the new refrigerator at all. The butter is too darn hard and the beer is too darn cold, he complained. Papa blurted out whatever was on his mind, regardless of the consequences, and had passed this quirk on to me. One of us was usually in trouble with my mother, or Jean. She soon noticed the rest of my father's quirks. He read, watched TV, and smoked all at the same time. He smothered me with solicitousness and made all my decisions for me. Jean and I couldn't go anywhere without him as a protector. He was champing at the bit. In his mind, they had retired him too early. He would always be a policeman. He said that half of Germany's citizens were either crazy or drunk, and it was his job to keep that half from bothering the other half. On one hand, he was fair and generous. On the other hand, his hot temper and impatience sometimes got in the way. He was determined to share what he had and to show us a good time, even if it meant shouting down the bossy women streetcar conductors who complained that he was taking too long to board as he loaded me, my wheelchair, and kids onto the car. He was strong and quick, and no one could have done it faster. It was usually our boys, unused to public transportation, who slowed things down. Father also put us on passenger ferries across the Baltic and took us by boat to Denmark. On every sea excursion, he enjoyed frightening Jean by pretending to roll me off the docks into the water. Father often got on Jean's nerves. Her biggest gripe turned out to be his use of her purse. She was probably no different than most women when it came to purses. Hers was an extension of herself, filled with cosmetics, feminine products, and a bit of money. No one ever dared look in her purse until my father came into her life. Every time we travelled on a passenger ferry or bought tickets for some kind of entertainment, he gave her all the tickets to hold while he pushed my wheelchair. Yet when he needed the tickets, she could never come up with them fast enough. Soon he would be up to the elbow in her purse while she gritted her teeth, trying not to scream. He and my sons pushed me along the sidewalks downtown and to the parks. On the first of these excursions, our youngest son came running out of the men's room saying, Mum, there's a woman in the restroom. She was appalled to see older women working in public toilets. Rag in hand, they ushered people into the stalls for ten fenigs and handed out soap and towels for another ten fenigs. This is an unsanitary way to make a living and it should be outlawed, she exclaimed. Father grinned. He couldn't resist. We're proud of it. What other country do you know of that can make money out of this? On our next trip, three years later, the elderly Toilette Frauen was still on the job, and on our third trip, driving nearly the length of Germany from Frankfurt to Holland, she began to notice how they put their individual stamp on the restrooms over which they presided. Doilies, fresh flower arrangements, pictures, a comfortable chair, and usually their old, battered, balloon-tired bicycles parked inside, made Jean believe that these old women were definitely a dying breed and that someone should record them in a photojournalistic essay. We made our last trip to see my family three years later, as my mother was succumbing to cancer. Just Jean and I travelled to Germany that time. The boys stayed with friends. Frieda Stammer was the first to see us when we entered the apartment building. Your mother is happy that you came so far to see her. Best of all, she is in remission. We were so amazed at finding Mother feeling well that we rented a van to accommodate three couples, which included my sister and brother-in-law. I wanted to retrace her life and some of mine with her. Riding in a car or van was an unusual experience for my family. None of them, including my policeman father, knew how to drive a motorised vehicle. When we came to a traffic light they would shout, Red! Yellow! Green! They never tired of the game. When we arrived at each destination, they always remarked, so quick. Accustomed to travelling on public conveyances with many stops along the way, 
they were always amazed at how quickly we arrived. Before I even came to a full stop, my safety-conscious wife would have to close her eyes and clench her teeth to keep from shrieking, Sit down! while my senior citizen father threw open the door of the van and jumped out. She always expected him to trip and sprain an ankle, but his sense of balance never let him down. This was our chance to see picturesque areas unscathed by war. We drove north via Flensburg to Krusau, the Danish town just north of the present German-Danish border where my mother was born. Erika even helped mother find her old playground. This is where you played, Mommy. Yes, yes, that's the place. Are the swings still there? I was the baby of the family, and my brothers and sisters took me there every day that it didn't rain. We went across Jutland, north of the border, with Germany to Tonda. This had been my first garrison in Denmark as a recruit. We headed south to Husum, the locale of the book The Grey City by the Grey Sea. It was here that we drove on the Wattenir of sea ground while the tide headed out. Unwittingly, we chose a day with extremely strong tides. Suddenly, we had to hightail it back as the tide turned and rushed in, frightening us with its power. As water splashed up to the floorboards, I used my Minnesota technique for driving in slippery weather and got out of there. We drove south through centuries-old Hansel and Gretel-type villages until we arrived at one known for its many nests of storks. White storks migrate between there and the Holy Land and nest there because of the numerous swamps. Storks build their huge nests over the chimneys of thatch-roofed cottages. Human tenants are not allowed to light their fireplaces during the summer nesting period. Mother scanned the roofs for birds. Look. A pair with hatchlings. As we stopped to take photos of the storks with tall, gangly chicks to feed, we watched one of the adults walk to the edge of the roof and take off with slow, audible flaps. Within minutes, the stork was flying back, a huge frog with legs a dangle clamped in its beak. Now we knew the origin of the German fable of where babies come from. On another outing, we drove the same road through the Holstein, Swiss hills and lakes which I had covered by bicycle when I went absent without leave. When Jean grasped the distance, she was as amazed as my parents had been many years before. Now my parents could laugh about it. In fact, they laughed until they cried. The road led to Lübeck, my chaotic point of departure to Africa and my lacklustre discharge. The enchanted city I adored as a child was completely restored. How I wished that the hearts and souls of humans who survived the war could be similarly restored to their original condition. On the other hand, our scars never let us forget how easily a war is started and how badly it ends. From Lübeck we headed south to the Lüneburger Heide, an area that resembles the heather-covered areas of Scotland that I grew to admire. We hired a horse and carriage and marvelled at the mauve, lavender and purple colours of heather glowing under a bright blue sky as far as the eye could see. Locals had heather for sale, woven into delicate basketry. Jean took a picture of my parents in the soft mauve light while they were still in the carriage. That photo, showing the humour, compassion and dignity in their faces, has inspired me ever since. They had survived the war and found meaning in their lives by appreciating the essence of their friends and relatives. They shared what they had and emotionally supported those around them. As I looked at them with the wisdom of a 40-year-old, I thought that my parents might have forced themselves to survive in order to help those they loved. Like me, teenage soldier, captive, lonely immigrant and single parent. How would I have made it without their letters and prayers? One night, as we were sitting in the living room, my father started talking about their 50th wedding anniversary, which they had celebrated the year before. Jean said to me with a laugh, Wow, 50 years. I've learned a lot from your mother. She's perfected a technique to cope with impulsive guys like you and your dad. With a smile, Jean asked my mother what her 50 years of marriage had been like. Mother shocked both of us. She jumped out of her chair, took off her shoe, and pretended to beat my father about the head and shoulders with it. I expected my father to get mad, 
but instead he smiled, whispered in her ear, turned to put on a record, then swept around again and gallantly asked her to dance. They performed a country courtship dance, which ended with my mother sitting on my father's knee. They executed it so perfectly that they had to admit that they had practiced it a lot for their anniversary party. My mother's happiness showed me how pleased she was that I could be with her while she was still feeling well, although this went unspoken. She seldom mentioned her surgery and chemotherapy. My father forbade us to talk about it. I felt uneasy, knowing that this would probably be the last time I would see her. She didn't know the cause of her cancer, but she asked me to quit smoking. I quit cold turkey, and so did Jean. Mother died less than a year later. Shortly after her death, my father also died of cancer. Then two years later, my brother-in-law passed away, and my sister died shortly after him. In retrospect, I saw that had I taken Jörg to Germany at the time I was divorced, we would have ended up alone again. The family who had written faithfully every week was gone, all but 25-year-old Helga, who had lost all of her closest relatives in a few short years. Death was an all-too-frequent visitor in American families during the Vietnam era as well. The war showed no signs of winding down. President Lyndon Baines Johnson could not escape the chants emanating from crowds surrounding the White House, crowds that grew larger and louder by the day. Hey, hey, LBJ, how many boys will you kill today? In the midst of this, our sons grew up in the era that altered American society forever. Hippies, free love, drugs, demonstrations against war, and marches for civil liberty were their heritage. Only God knew what our boys would do. They graduated from high school, moved out as a first step toward independence, and faced the fact that they were draft age. The boys ran hot and cold about signing up before they were called up. Neither was sent to Vietnam. But I went there 25 years later, on a mission to save lives, not destroy them.